Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Dwayne was saying, we're going to talk a little bit about deploying Python and R to Spark and Hadoop. So who am I? I'm Daniel Rodriguez. I'm one of the product managers and, uh, for the data science part of Anaconda and Anaconda Enterprise. I am from Colombia. I have an electrical engineer um, degree uh, that I got in Colombia. I also have a master's in IT management and business intelligence uh, that I got here in the US. I joined Anaconda a little bit more than three years ago. Uh, and I did uh, a little bit of software development, DevOps, and now program management for data science. Uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, Spark, especially, especially for Python and R. Uh, what are the problems that we have when we try to do Python jobs with Spark? Uh, again, with Python and R. Uh, and some of the tooling that uh, we have for uh, solving these problems and why um, this problem exists. Uh, some of the tooling, especially for Python and R, since we're going to see later, Spark is written in Scala. It's a JVM-based uh, tooling for deploying and distributing computation. How Anaconda Enterprise works with that, uh, how we connect to Spark clusters, how we connect to multiple cl Spark clusters, and how can we help with some of the nuances that you guys uh, face when you start doing a, a Python and R jobs uh, in a Spark. And we're going to see a little bit of the demos that I prepared for you guys on uh, the setup that we provide and some of the PySpark tooling and the uh, Sparkly R tooling that we, that we ship inside Anaconda Enterprise. So this is the diagram of Anaconda Enterprise. Uh, and Anaconda is uh, the only data science platform that provides functionality both in the desktop and in the servers. Uh, so that's the, the first part that we see on, on the left. And we provide collaboration, governance, deployment, all of, all of that is authenticated and audited, and we provide access to all of that. And with some red arrows, I'm pointing the things that we're going to show, uh, that we're going to show today, uh, especially the party collaboration using Jupyter and Zeppelin, uh, deployment of applications using Spark and R, uh, Python and R, and especially we're going to be targeting Spark and Hadoop. So that's the last arrow that we see right there. Uh, OK, so Spark. What is Spark? Uh, sorry. So what is Spark? Spark, uh, by the definition on the website, is a fast and general engine for large scale data processing. Uh, the nice thing is that you can write applications in Java, Scala, Scala Python, and R. Uh, you can combine SQL, streaming, and complex analytics. That basically means you can write any function, and you can uh, scale that function as a new DF inside a Spark. You can run a Spark not only in Hadoop, even though that's the, the, uh, the main case that people see. We can also use it on Apache Mesos, Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is the platform that we ship inside Anaconda Enterprise. You can run a standalone on your computer or in a standalone servers uh, or in the cloud uh, uh, with all the cloud providers, uh, including Amazon, Google, uh, and Azure. Uh, and the nice thing about Spark is that you can access all the data sources that you uh, can ever imagine, uh, including different data file formats like Parquet uh, or just JSON files, uh, databases, anything. Uh, this is a diagram of how the Spark uh, data flow works, and we're going to take a look at why this is complicated for Python and R. Uh, as, I've been, as I said before, Spark is a, a Scala-based project, uh, so it runs in the JVM. So when you create a Spark context uh, using Python, uh, you're going to use Py4j uh, to serialize all the data from the JVM to the Python and R process. Uh, and that creates uh, uh, some problems, uh, because you're going to have to start serializing all your data back and forth within your Python process and the uh, Spark processes in the Spark context. Uh, uh, and the Spark context includes the Spark workers and the Spark driver that manages the uh, scheduling of job between all the workers. Uh, we're going to take a look at how that has been solved in the community with different projects like Apache Arrow. Uh, the latest release of uh, Apache Spark included some fixes for that, and how the community is trying to solve that serialization problem uh, using Spark. Uh, so that's the definition of uh, Spark, uh, the official definition. Well, my definition is, um, what do I want from Spark? So I want to access multiple data sources and data file formats. I want to access data from Hive. I want to access data from HDFS, uh, some traditional SQL database. And I want to access different file formats, uh, usually Parquet for columnar data or any other file format that I have on HDFS. Uh, and as a data scientist, I want to take my data analysis, and uh, usually in Python and R. Uh, uh, some people in the data engineering world they use a lot of Scala. That's fine. But for data scientists, Python and R is the most uh, used format, uh, the most used language. And I want to deploy that into production. I want to take the toy project that I wrote into in Python. I want to scale it, and I want to make uh, some. Uh, I want to generate some business um, value. Uh, then uh, I want to have a more powerful and flexible processing of the data. And I don't want to be limited by the data tools that I have on my, on my local uh, workstation, on my laptop. 
I don't want my workflow to change uh, at all or too much if it's possible. Uh, I'm used to working in Jupyter or R Studio, and I don't want to change that. I want to scale my, pr my data and my processing, but I don't want to change that too much if, po if, po if possible. Uh, I want seamless combination of the tools that I already know. I already spent a lot of time learning Python. I spent a lot of time learning R. I want to keep using that, but I also want to leverage the new tools that allow me to uh, scale. So why is Spark? Uh, knows a CC uh, as na native Python and R. And the reality is that uh, Spark is a Scala-based project, so it's never going to be native. Uh, as we saw in the first diagram, uh, serialization has to be done between the JVM process and the Python processes. Uh, there is work being done to, uh, to fix that as much as possible, but the reality is that it's never going to be the same. Uh, the data structures that we provide, or that Spark provides, uh, are different than the data structures that we have in Python and R. So the main data structure for data analysis in Python is the pandas data frame, and uh, in R is the native R data frame. Uh, and those uh, data structures are different in uh, uh, Spark. They has RDDs, data sets, Spark data frames. Uh, there are similar stru data structures with similar APIs, but they're different. And uh, they don't have the same functionality. For example, Windows functionality is available in pandas. You might not have that in Spark. And there is even a different API for every single uh, interface to Spark. So Spala Spark has a different, uh, Spala Spark has a different uh, API, and it's usually the most maintained one. It's usually the one that is up to date with the uh, Spark API. PySpark is lagging a little bit, and Spark R, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, is lagging a lot. And uh, there has been the research of newer tools from R Studio, for example, uh, using Sparkly R to try to catch up uh, R for uh, leveraging the Spark APIs and the Spark uh, workflow. Uh, there is also a problem because I want to uh, use both interacti interactive, I uh, have an interactive workflow, I have uh, also like, I want to also be able to uh, schedule jobs, uh, batch jobs for my data processing. So I want to be able to launch my Jupyter Notebook or my R Studio and do interactive code like I do while I do my data analysis. But I also want to take that and put it into a batch job that it gets run every week, every day. I might also want to take that same job and put it into a streaming uh, workflow and have data streaming in real time and being um, process that Spark job that I created, and that Spark job can be just some data cleaning, data munging, or it can be a, a machine learning model training in Spark. Uh, resource management is a big deal. Uh, when you're working in, uh, in your local laptop, in your local workstation, you just uh, import pandas, and you can use basically all the resources of your laptop. But while you're uh, starting to use a Spark, you start to manage multiple servers. You start to manage multiple users on that uh, Spark cluster, usually. And you need to start thinking about resource management for that. If you're using a Spark standalone, it's going to be very complicated. Uh, if you're using Yarn, in theory, it's more easy. Sometimes it's even more complicated than that. Uh, and that's something that we have to take in, in, into account when we're starting to think about deploying Spark uh, jobs. Uh, dependencies are not local, and this is the same thing. A Spark is a remote cluster that we have installed in my local workstation. I have Anaconda, I have all the dependencies. I can Conda install, but when I have a Spark job, I cannot do that as easy. Uh, and I want to leverage all the libraries. I want to leverage NLTK. I want to leverage all the Python and R libraries that allow me to do my data science. Uh, unfortunately, managing that dependencies is hard. And as I mentioned before, serialization between Python and R and the JVM is complicated. There is new projects. Uh, Apache R is the one that I like the most for that. And there has been work uh, done in the Spark community to introduce Apache R to, to that, uh, to make it better. And how can the open source and Anaconda Enterprise help to solve some of these issues? And that's what we're going to be seeing. Uh, so the runtime first, also known as my Python and R libraries. So Anaconda and Conda solved this problem for the, for the desktop. Uh, that's no longer a problem anymore. Uh, you just download Anaconda. You, can, you get a bunch of Python libraries. You can install a bunch of R libraries, uh, more if you want. But what about the distributed engines? What about my Spark cluster? What about my MPI cluster? What about all of that? Uh, how can I use these libraries that I already use for developing my Spark job into my distributed cluster? Uh, so to solve that, we partnered with uh, Cloudera and Hortonworks, and we have developed uh, a way of installing Anaconda into those two uh, distributed, well, dis into those two distributions of Hadoop. Uh, and we're going to see how we take the Python and R libraries that are needed for our Spark jobs, and we deploy them into this cluster, so any Spark job can leverage those libraries that people are known to use. Uh, uh, and the way it works is like, I have already Anaconda in my in locally, my Anaconda distribution. I have a bunch of environments that I use. Maybe I have only one environment, but I want that, at least that Anaconda distribution on my cluster. 
Then we have Anaconda Enterprise, and we take the same environment. We are trying to do uh, a parity between all the conda environments between multiple, em between multiple distributions or between multiple IT environments. One is local, one is Anaconda Enterprise, and the latest one is the Spark cluster. In this case, uh, it could be a Cloudera cluster or a Hortonworks cluster. And we want to take both all those environments and ship it into both my Anaconda Enterprise and my Spark cluster. And I want to maintain that same workflow. And the nice thing about Anaconda is the only distribution, the only, the only data science platform that allows me to do local development, enterprise development into my Anaconda Enterprise, and also ship the same environment and keep the seamless uh, distribution of those environments between all those, all those jobs. This is a simple screenshot of how it looks in, uh, uh, in Cloudera Manager. I, uh, and uh, I'm going to show a video how to install, how it is to install that at the end. Uh, but you can see uh, a little bit in the middle, we have Chipping Anaconda. Uh, and it's distributed and activated, so that particular Anaconda parcel is ready to use and is ready to be used by my uh, Spark job. Uh, the second part is the connectivity. Uh, so as we saw in the first diagram, uh, Spark is a remote engine that, that I need to get access to, to, uh, to use it for my, for my particular job. And the way it works in Anaconda Enterprise is that we use uh, an HTTP connection based on uh, Apache Live. Uh, so Anaconda Enterprise is on the left, and then we have a Spark cluster on the right. And uh, before both my project editor sessions and my deployed applications, I can use the same connection to my Live server that is going to give me a gateway to the Spark cluster and I can use that for interactive e development in my project editor and for batch jobs in my deploy applications. And that Livy is going to take care of spawning multiple sections of a Spark, managing that uh, multiple sections of a Spark natively in the cluster. I don't have to install anything else other than Livy in my uh, Cloudera or Hortonworks cluster. I don't have to set the Livy server, and that will take care of that. And we're going to see how that looks at the end. Um, so how an account enterprise is Apache Livy is a REST service. So no longer you need to like uh, have your HDFS uh, uh, side XML or your uh, Hive uh, side XML, Jarn side XML files in your, log in your workstation or in your laptop to connect to these clusters. You can just have a Livy server uh, that is an HTTP request. An HTTP request is just uh, a REST service. And based on that, Livy is going to take care of creating the sessions, managing the sessions, managing the connection. Uh, it's included, it's very secure, includes Kerberos with impersonation. You have all the security that you had already in your regular Spark cluster. You have it again um, with Livy. Uh, it, it allows you to do session management. This is really important uh, because, as we mentioned before, uh, when you're working on a distributed cluster, you're not alone. You usually have a cluster for your data science team, for your data engineering team, and multiple people are going to be launching jobs inside Spark. Uh, uh, you can use interactive, uh, Scala, Python, and R. And that's one thing, uh, because before Livy, there were multiple tools that allowed me to distribute jobs that I already written. Uh, so basically, I package my job in a jar file, and I send it to Uzi or whatever tool I, I use for my data management pipeline, and that would run the job uh, all the, uh, in, a, in a schedule. But uh, that didn't allow me to use my interactivity features that I have from Zeppelin or for Livy uh, or for Jupyter. But Livy allows me to do that for both Scala, Python, and R. And one of the nice things is that you can connect to multiple cluster clusters for one session. And in previous versions of Anaconda Enterprise uh, and previous um, users, uh, they used to install Anaconda Enterprise inside uh, the same Cloudera cluster or Hortonworks cluster as a gateway node, in a gateway node. And that allowed me to connect to that particular cluster, but didn't allow me to connect to other clusters. All that session, the session that was running in that particular cluster could only have access to, to the development cluster, for example. And to promote a job to my QA cluster and my production cluster, it was very complicated. Uh, it allowed me to like, actually go and install Anaconda Enterprise in those nodes. But with Livy and with Anaconda Enterprise 5, we don't need that. You can connect from one session to multiple uh, IT environments inside my, my, my company and my network. Uh, this is the diagram of how the Livy architecture works. So as I mentioned before, it's a REST server. Uh, and a client uh, is going to be able to create one or multiple connections, and will create multiple Spark contexts for that. And the REST server is going to take care of uh, launching a Spark driver and a Spark executors, uh, and it will use whatever cluster manager uh, is using uh, on the backend. So the most popular one is Jarn, and it will use Jarn to launch all those uh, Spark jobs and Spark uh, drivers and executors. Uh, I'm going to do uh, a couple of uh, demos. I'm going to show a video on how this looks like inside Anaconda Enterprise. Uh, so I am in the video. 
Okay, so I'm going to show first how to install the Anaconda parcel. So this is a Cloudera uh, CDH cluster. And I'm gonna just going to go to the parcels uh, view. And here is where I can see all the parcels that I have available for uh, this Cloudera cluster. This is a brand new Cloudera cluster. So I'm just going to go to the configuration. And I'm going to add a new uh, repository. So this is the repository for the free uh, version of an the Anaconda parcel. But uh, with uh, Anaconda Enterprise, you can create uh, custom parcels. Uh, so we provide a free version for Python 2 of Anaconda 4.4. But if you want to create multiple parcels for different uh, environments, Python 3 environment, or even multiple environments in one parcel, you can use that. Uh, you can do it inside Anaconda Enterprise. And you can just point it to your Anaconda Enterprise repo right there, and you will be able to install all the parcels that you have available and that you created inside Anaconda Enterprise. Uh, so once I do that and refresh, I see that I have an Anaconda uh, parcel available. And then I just have to click Download. Uh, and we'll, what we try to do here, and what Cloudera provides us, is a really easy way to just install Anaconda. And the way I think about it is the way, same way you download Anaconda distribution from the website. You download a .exe file that is an MSI file or uh, an application in your Mac, and you double click it, and then you're like, next, 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 next. It's basically the same workflow for not installing Anaconda distribution in one computer, but you're installing it in the whole cluster. So uh, we use a little bit right there. Uh, it downloaded the, the, the parcel, then I click another button, the same button, uh, to distribute the parcel to the whole cluster. And what that's doing is, uh, distributing the Anaconda distribution inside all these, uh, all these uh, Cloudera uh, nodes that I have right there. Uh, so very, very easy. It takes uh, a couple of seconds to install this, like a minute in top. This is like real time. I did not speed up that part of the, of the video. Um, so we're just gonna wait for this to finish uh, a little bit. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. Uh, go back a second. And then I click activate. And then they told me, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. And it will activate the parcel. And once that's ready, I can use Anaconda inside uh, any Spark job that I have on that particular cluster. So I'm just going to go a little bit faster right there. Uh, OK, and that's ready. I, the parcel is distributed and activated. And I can use my Anaconda distribution that I like on my laptop. I can use that on my Cloudera cluster. Uh, and how to use that, because, okay, I have my libraries, but if I don't uh, show any code, it's going to be like, okay, what does that even do for me? So we can use that uh, using PySpark. So for one second, let's stop one second right here, and we can see the uh, Anaconda Enterprise version 5.12. That is the latest version that we have available. And here I have one project that is called Spark Reddit, and we're seeing the Jupyter Lab ID inside Anaconda Enterprise. And uh, what we are going to do in this particular example is we're going to load data from the uh, ready data set. It's a dump of the ready data. And I'm only going to use data from the first uh, three months of the 2007 year 2017. And what's, what's happening here is that I'm using an open source project called Spark Magic to launch, uh, to create a connection to my Libby server. And the Libby server is automatically creating a Spark session. So any code that I execute in this particular cell is going to be executed remotely in the uh, Spark cluster. So this, uh, the first cell that is executed is going to create a uh, session, a Spark session automatically. So you can see that it's saying it's starting a Spark application. And when it finishes, when it returns, it's telling me that the ID of this session is 5. And I have already a Spark session created. So I'm ready to go. I'm good to go. Uh, it will return me a Spark context in a Spark version 1. Point, uh, in all the versions of Spark 1. And in Spark 2, that's the one I'm using. It's going to return me my Spark session uh, variable. So I can just start using that to, for example, read data from the Parquet data set that I created. Uh, so I can just execute that particular column, that particular uh, cell, and it's going to create some uh, data frame. It's going to create a data frame with the data inside that. Uh, and here I can pause again. I can see all the all the columns that I have available. So this is a Hive table. I'm just using the read uh, uh, load for Parquet files, but uh, I could use also Hive and my Hive context to query this particular data set and get a data frame back from uh, from that table. And we can see all the columns that I have available for this particular data set. And then I can start doing simple queries. So for example, telling me how many comments uh, were posted. Uh, in, uh, in the first three months of uh, 2017. That's the whole data set I have right there. 
and you will tell me very quickly that I have uh, 230 million comments on that particular data frame. And then I can start using the PySpark API to filter and do some simple computations. So for example, how many posts were uh, done in the subreddit, in the soccer subreddit? I can do that. Uh, all, all interactive, all uh, powered by a, a, a Anaconda Enterprise and the connectivity with Apache Live to a, to a cluster, to a Spark cluster. And it will tell me that I have, I think, 1 million comments, uh, 140,000 comments here. Uh, and then I can start to do a little bit more complicated things like grouping by the number of subreddits, by the subreddit, and then counting the number of posts that I have on that particular subreddit. Uh, this is just very simple PySpark API. And in a second, it will uh, return a data frame. Uh, this is a Spark data frame, and I, I am using at the end show the first 10 items. So it's telling me what are the first, uh, the most popular 10 subreddits uh, in the first three months of 2017. Uh, and uh, the final part that I'm going to show in this particular notebook is uh, how to move data from my Spark cluster to uh, my local Sparks, to my local Python session. Uh, this is a very common workflow for all our data science users. Uh, they want to use both Spark and Pandas, for example. Uh, because they know pandas, they love pandas, they know how to plot, they know how to do windowing functions, they know how to do that. Uh, and they already did the big data process in Spark, and they want to move that data back now to my uh, local workstation, to my local session of uh, my local Python session right here. Uh, so what is going to happen now is I'm going to import a couple of functions, and I'm going to do a frequency count of by day, uh, and it's going to tell me how many posts were done by day in, uh, in the MBA subreddit. Uh, so we can see a frequency of the, of the posts. So uh, just one going back one second. Uh, what is showing here is a Spark data frame. So this is a Spark data frame right here. Uh, and this is all remote. Nothing has been moved to my, close to my lo local session yet. Uh, and the way to move that to my local session is creating a temporal table. This, uh, this, uh, this frequency variable is a Spark data frame. And I can register a temporal table that I'm going to call freq. And then I'm going to use the Spark magic uh, call uh, SQL function that is included with Anaconda Enterprise. Uh, and that it comes from the Spark magic uh, project. And I'm going to say, OK, execute this query, select everything from the new table that I created, and save that to a temporal data frame that I'm calling df, uh, df underscore temp. So when I execute this uh, particular cell, this is going to the Spark cluster converting that to a pandas data frame and serializing that and sending it back to my local session. Um, and when it finishes, run a little bit faster, uh, and we're going to see here that I have two, two, da two data frames. This is the Spark data frame, and this is the same data frame, but now this is a pandas data frame that is local to my local uh, Jupyter session. And with that data frame, I can do all the stuff that I can do with, uh, with pandas. I can do. Uh, a plot. That is what I'm going to do at the end. I'm going to keep using the local magic. So all this code is going to be executed locally for my particular session in Jupyter. I'm importing pandas, and I'm importing uh, in, uh, adding matplotlib, so I can plot a, a very simple plot. And I do a very, very simple uh, pandas computation, and I plot the uh, frequency of posts by day on that particular subreddit. Uh, so we can see something funny here, like two particular peaks on two particular days. So you can start analyzing maybe somebody famous uh, went to Reddit that day and they uh, uh, and asked me anything, or maybe it was the finals on the ABA. Uh, so you can start analyzing all that data. Uh, and it will be really hard to actually see this uh, from the Spark data frame and just with a table. But once you plot this, it's very easy to see it. Uh, and that shows the power of doing the computation of uh, 230 million comments in a Spark, getting to the value when I get, moving it back to my local session, and plotting that into uh, uh, into my notebook using just Jupyter and Pandas. Uh, so here, I, he I had Livey. So this was the Livey uh, UI. Let's go back for that one second. So this is how it looks when there is nothing, nothing running. Uh, there's no sessions. Uh, so that was before I started my Spark session. But if I refresh this page, I'm going to be able to see the all the sessions that I'm running. So in this case, I'm only running one session because it's a PySpark session that I, I, just, I just ran. Uh, but one, once I click on that, I can see a log of every single command that was executed on that particular job. And I can see the logs of all the jobs that were run before this. Uh, and you can see every single uh, uh, command that I executed on my notebook 
uh, it shows here. So I did a couple of Spark commands just to get this running. Then I read some, uh, I read some data from a, uh, from a file for from a file in HDFS. I printed that. I did some count. Uh, I did the frequency count. So this is all the things that was executed on uh, on a Spark. And then I can uh, also see the output of that that particular thing. Let's go back for one second before changing. Uh, so you can see that I can have a log of every single action that was executed on that particular job uh, for the uh, Spark uh, in the Spark cluster. Uh, and the last example uh, I wanted to show is uh, SparkLyR and Shiny. Uh, so SparkLyR is a new library that it came up, uh, I think like a year ago, from uh, the RStudio folks. And the idea with that is they realized that the Spark R API was very lagging uh, on number of features for both compared to both Scala, Spark, and PySpark. And they decided to write their own API uh, on top of that. And they came up with a really, really nice uh, project that is called SparkLyR. Uh, and what that project tries to do is mimic the R workflow as much as possible. Uh, and we're going to see how that works. So this is, again, Anaconda Enterprise. I have a new project called SparkLyR Shiny. And this is an R, an R session. So you can see I have both R and Python inside Anaconda Enterprise. And I have some Python code, uh, some R code, I'm sorry. And uh, the idea with this project, what I want to show is that I didn't write any of this code. The, I took this code from the gallery of SparkLyR. And I want to show how it's possible just to talk any R or Python code that you already have and make it uh, work in Anaconda Enterprise and leverage uh, a connectivity using Apache Live V to that. So I copy all the, all the code exactly, and I just had to change one line. So I had some imports at the beginning. I only had to add one line to this code that is changing the way SparkLyR connects uh, to the Libby server. So instead of uh, doing the first line that is creating a local Spark session, uh, uh, SparkLyR will launch a local Spark session for you if you don't have one. And that's how they ship an example. If you don't have that, uh, and you want to connect it to a Libby server, all you have to do is change that line and tell it, OK, my master is in this URL, and the method I want to use is Libby. Uh, and that's, that's all you have to change. Uh, all the other code stays the same. Uh, and this particular application is an, a, a shiny application that is very simple. Uh, and it's using the NYC flights data set that is a very known uh, data set in both Python and R. Uh, and one of the nice things about SparkLyR is that it keeps all the API that people, uh, that, Spark, that our users know, uh, especially with the deployer. So our users are very known to do data monitoring using deployer. And SparkLyR, because it came from the same people in our studio, uh, they have exactly the same API to work with our data frames. The, the, so you can use the same API that you use with deployer for our data frames. You can use it inside Spark data frames using SparkLyR. So I'm not a Spark expert. Uh, and R expert, I'm sorry, but I, I can see that uh, I can do some filtering. I can do some left joins. I can mutate. This basically is adding, adding a new column based on two other columns. I can select uh, to filter uh, the data set. And this is very easy to, write, to read from uh, uh, an R user and a deployer user. Uh, that's one really nice thing is that you don't have to change any of your workflow. And that's one thing that we mentioned. Like, I want to keep using the same workflow that I use for my Spark sessions. Uh, the same workflow that I have for my R session. So I didn't have to change any code, basically. Uh, we're going to keep going on this video. Uh, on this particular example, it's also doing a linear regression. And this linear regression is using the Spark uh, ML API to generate a linear regression. So it's not doing anything locally. It's all, doing, it's, it's all going to a remote cluster. Uh, and then I'm just doing a shiny, then it's doing a shiny uh, a Shiny UI. So Shiny is a way to write uh, applications using no JavaScript and no HTML, just R, uh, similar to what Bokeh provides you in Python or Plotly provides you in Python. Uh, Shiny is the, like the standard for writing applications and their applications in R. Uh, and once I have that, I can just deploy inside Anaconda Enterprise, and this is how it looks like. Uh, again, this is an example that I just literally copy pasted from the Spark LR, from the Spark LR demos. And this particular uh, model is trying to tell you, uh, trying to help you pick the best flights between uh, multiple airports. So you can see uh, from JFK to Boston or to other, to Denver or to other LAX in LA, other airports, uh, how, how does that, um, it's, it's telling you, this, this plot is telling you the, 
Um, this is what is telling you the time gaining every flight uh, by minutes. Uh, so this is just showing you the data. Uh, just showing you the data that we have in the, in the, in the data set. The second tab is uh, making a, a plot of uh, the actual flight uh, trajectories uh, that the flights have uh, between multiple airports. And the last tab is probably the most important one, is the one that is actually using the linear model that we trained before in Spark. And it's using that same model to make a prediction on which is the best airport that you, the best flight that you want to use uh, to get from one place to the other one. So in this particular one, it's going from JFK to SEA. And it's telling you that uh, if you pick the JetBlue flight, uh, you are probably going to lose uh, 3.3 minutes, like in general. Uh, and then f uh, other ones are like more, more extreme. For example, uh, 23 minutes. This is an average for all day. It's a prediction of how much you're going to lose uh, if you pick this particular flight. Uh, so all these look pretty terrible because they all they are all bad. But this one, they actually tell you oh, you're going to actually you should pick Envoy instead of Endeavor uh, if you're going from uh, JFK to DCA. I don't know what DCA is, but uh, if you want to go there, uh, you should pick Envoy instead of the other other flight. Uh, so this is a very simple application how to use some data, train a model in Spark, deploy a local application inside Anaconda Enterprise, and use that same model and that same uh, Spark model and that is the same Spark connectivity that is using a remote cluster uh, to uh, show some value and, and do a simple dashboard. OK, uh, so that's the end of the demo. So I'm going to go back to this, to this guy. Uh, so what we saw in the demo was the setup of how to install an Anaconda parcel, how to use Livey uh, to connect to a, uh, from an Anaconda enterprise to that, uh, an interactive example uh, using PySpark and Spark, uh, via Spark Magic. So Spark Magic is the library that we use to connect to the Livey server. Uh, uh, and this is the interactive example. So like I said, I want to keep using my interactive notebooks. I want to use Zeppelin. If I know Zeppelin, I want to use Jupyter. If I, if I know Jupyter, I don't want to change that. And Spark Magic and Livey provides you with that. And the last example was an Sparkly R and Shiny dashboard. So this is not interactive. This is a deployed application that a business analyst can use to uh, gather some value and take, uh, make some decisions based on the insights that the data provides. Uh, so before, oh, actually, before I move to that, is like Anaconda Enterprise is the governance on the enterprise data platform, uh, and is the only data platform that allows you to go from like local development. Anaconda Enterprise in your, uh, in your servers for collaboration and security and all the good stuff, and also go beyond that and install and manage jobs and, uh, and dependencies, everything in, in a Spark cluster. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take that.